It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 62, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Brenton Johnson started growing vegetables in his backyard in Austin, and then in his front yard, and then he started selling them, and then he moved to a larger acreage, and then to an even larger acreage at his current location 15 miles east of Austin, Texas. Johnson's backyard garden is a little bit bigger now, with 150 acres of vegetables and over 100 employees, and all of this since he first started selling vegetables in 2006. In this episode, Brenton shares the hows and the whys of growing Johnson's backyard garden, and we take a look at the organization behind his custom box CSA, farmer's market sales, and crop management, as well as irrigation and the use of storage facilities to extend the season into the hot Texas summer. Johnson's backyard garden also has a reputation as a marketing powerhouse, and we get into how Brenton has built the JBG brand. We also discuss Brenton's approach to the entrepreneurial aspects of farming and how Brenton has managed the fast pace of change in his business. I hope you enjoy this episode just as much as I enjoyed making it for you. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost space living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. This episode of the Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by Growing for Market Magazine, America's most respected source for news and ideas about the business of growing and selling vegetables, fruits, cut flowers, plants, herbs, and other food products growingformarket.com. All right, Brenton Johnson, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Well, thanks for having me, Chris. I'm happy to uh, be here today. So glad you could join us. We were talking in the pre-show chat a little bit about what the weather's like down there. You said here we are at the beginning of April and you've already got okra in the garden there. Well, this year we had an extremely mild winter uh, in Austin. Uh, there was only three light freezes. I think it got down to 31, 32 degrees this year. And uh, we were able to get our crops in a little bit earlier. Our last average frost here is March, I think around the second week of March, March 12th. But uh, we got our tomatoes in the first week of March, and we've already got our okra peppers. We're harvesting squash uh, now that we put in a, a high tunnel. We got our squash out in the field, our cucumbers out. Sweet potatoes are in the field, and we're we're waiting for the slips to uh, shoot up so we can get those planted. But now we're off to a, a great start for this year. It, uh, you know, the farmers always the eternal optimist, and so we're uh, we had such a rough season last year with uh, a spring flood, and we also had a fall uh, flood where we had 15 inches of rain in one day, wow. and we ended up having. A really, really tough time last year, so it's great to uh, to be off on the right foot for this season. Now, you're farming actually in Austin? Well, actually, um, I, I started in Austin. I started in my backyard in a 30 by 50 foot garden in, in East Austin. And then uh, after doing that for a couple of years there, I moved to um, 20 acres, just five miles east of downtown. And we farmed that for a couple of years before we ran out of space. And then uh, now we're actually about 15 miles east of Austin. Uh, and we're in the extraterritorial ju- jurisdiction for Austin, but we're not within the current city limits. We're right on the Colorado River. It's a historic, it used to be a dairy in the 30s and 40s, um, 50s, up until I think the dairy closed in the, in the 80s. And uh, it's just a beautiful piece of land where we've got amazing soils, 200 acres um, right on the river. We've got a wonderful water supply. Um, we've got six wells on our farm. That, and uh, I just don't think that we could have a have a, a better farm uh, land around here. It's uh, Austin's not really a, a big agricultural area, but we're lucky to to find some really nice fertile land uh, close to Austin. Now, you said you've got about 200 acres of land. How much of that is in vegetables? Uh, we have about 150 acres that are in vegetables out of the 200 there. Wow. So you guys started, and I think I think you said you started selling at Farmer's Market in 2005 there in Austin from that 30 by 50 foot backyard garden. And and now now you're at 150 acres of vegetables. I mean, that's kind of some crazy growth. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, we just put the, it, it feels kind of like uh, the other day I was driving my truck back from the farm and the accelerator pedal on the truck broke and my, I had to keep turning the key off just to, <laughs> to get it home to 
you know, but it, that's what it feels like with the way the farm is grown from the 30 by 50 foot garden, you know, to 200 acres today and over 100 employees. Uh, we, uh, it has been kind of the pedal to the metal and just hold on <laughs> for the for the ride. Uh, lately, the this, I guess the past year or two, we've gotten to a point where we feel like that um, we've been focused, we've been able to focus uh, more on on dialing in our operation and and not so much growth and looking at ways that we can be have better systems uh we're in the process of um just starting a to build a new uh, cold storage facility and packing shed on our farm and uh it's really kind of an exciting time for me my background is i'm a i got my agricultural engineering degree from auburn and uh, worked for the government for 10 years before kind of starting uh, farming as a hobby. And it it really, my hobby just totally got out of control. But uh, it's uh, it's fun. I think the thing that I like the most is uh, I really enjoy coming up with ways to take a really complex task of producing you know, over 200 different varieties of vegetables and trying to, uh, it's like never a dull moment on the farm, you know, because we sell to, um, we started out selling at the farmer's markets and then in the next, uh, in 2006, we began a, a CSA out of the 30 by 50 foot backyard garden that kind of expanded to the front yard and the side yard and had 17 different varieties of muscadine grapes growing over the uh, <laughs> the perimeter of the fence. I had uh, chickens in the back and a compost pile tucked in the corner and cucumbers climbing up trellises on the fences. And the front yard was filled with, you know, vegetables. It was just, uh, and then my wife said she, she didn't know what to think, you know, because we had a tire swing in the backyard and, uh, I was pushing the kids, you know, on the tire swing and swinging them out over the garden. All they had left was just a, like a little small concrete pad in the back porch, you know, for the for the kids to play. And uh, that's when we ended up starting to look for for a little bit more land, uh, and we're able to find the 20 acres just east of downtown. But I, you know, I think what I like though is. Is coming up with uh, with the systems, you know. It's uh, maybe that's part of it. With my background is in engineering, but um, we've uh, we've been working on it for some time now, and um, we've uh, we've developed some tools that have made it much more manageable. And it feels like that um, with the with the way that we kind of structured things that it's uh, even though we had such a bad year last year, we were able to manage uh, financially, even with the really tough times that we had last year, just by the fact that the core of our business is our CSA customers. And we have a, uh, a real strong support from that customer base that just made it uh, made last year bearable, I guess. <laughs> when you set out to start selling pro- product at market, were you thinking about having 150 acres of vegetables at some point? Did you sit down and, and say, you know, this is this is what we're going to need to make this work? Or is that something that just sort of happened to you? Well, really what happened was um, when I started off in college, I started I was studying mechanical engineering and I worked for two years as a mechanical engineer for a semester and as a um, as a student for the other semester and I was working uh, for a company in Mariana, Florida designing commercial laundry machines and after spending two years in industry and also uh, lots of Grateful Dead concerts uh, mixed in between school and and working, um, where I was selling grilled cheese sandwiches at, at concerts all the, all over the country, I I just kind of had a I, got, I guess I kind of had a, an awakening, and I went when I went back to college, I went and talked to my dean, and I just told him, you know, hey, uh, 
I really just don't, I don't think that I want to be, uh, I don't want to work in a factory, you know, I mean, I want to do something that where I feel like I'm contributing positively. And he's like, man, you're about to graduate from college. He's like, uh, you're just getting ready to start your senior year in mechanical engineering. He's like, why don't you go talk to the agricultural engineering department? And so I did. And that was the best advice that he could ever give me. He, uh, I went and talked to the Dean of Agricultural Engineering Department and I changed my major to that. Took courses in commercial vegetable production, worked on the organic farm at school at Auburn University. And, uh, you know, at the same time, I was gardening on the side of my house at, in college and had a, a garden there and helped my friends uh, in college set up a garden and convinced one of them to change their major to horticulture. And, uh, when I finished college and it was time to get a job, my um, I had a dream of, you know, finding an internship on an organic farm in California or something like that. And uh, my grandmother was like, Brenton, please, 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 you, you can apply to work on a hippie organic farm if you want, but just please apply for a real job. You know, we've sacrificed <laughs> and, sa- and saved for your, for your college. And so... I um I listened to my grandmother, Mama Nell, and I um I said, Okay, Mama Nell, I will. So I applied for a job as a water conservation program manager with the Bureau of Reclamation. And uh much to my dismay I ended up getting that job. <laughs> they sent me a job offer. And so uh I ended up living in Oregon for Southern Oregon for a year and then living in uh, Casper, Wyoming for three years. And then uh, I I worked with the Bureau of Reclamation uh, managing the water conservation program for the Bureau of Reclamation for Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, I think, for seven years I was here in Austin doing that. And uh, it, I, you know, definitely I didn't... Uh, I kind of had forgotten, you know, about my dreams of being a farmer, but it was just something that I loved to do. You know, I loved growing plants. I had a yard business growing up and I uh, uh, always liked to work really hard and just kind of was into just about everything, you know. And I think that was one of the reasons that engineering was a good fit, too, you know, um, that got to do a lot of the technical stuff. that got to do a lot of the design stuff as well. and. Uh, so I ended up, uh, when I moved to Austin in 2001, I, I got married in 2002 uh, to my high school sweetheart, and uh, she moved. Um, we were, were both from southeast Alabama, went to high school in Enterprise, Alabama. But we just started, we bought a house on the, on the east side that uh, at the time was kind of a uh, lower cost place to be in Austin. And, um, she's like, I'm going to leave the house for, and go take the kids home for a vacation. And when I come back, this place better be livable. So we fixed it up and, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I replaced the kitchen, the bathrooms, did all the electric, put air conditioning in it, uh, the plumbing all the way out to the street, um, replaced, I mean, just totally reworked the house over five weeks when she was gone. And uh, when we came back, she ended up deciding to start a little garden in the backyard. And um, I think I took it. I took over her garden. <laughs> that's uh, that's how it got started. There it was just uh, it wasn't a plan at all of becoming a farmer. It's just you know starting out as a as a hobby that that you know turned into a, turned into a business. And a, and I really think what happened was that I just discovered my passion. You know, like. I now that I look back, I can I can say I think that I was a more of a a born entrepreneur, but also just had a passion for 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 organic farming. And why did you decide to go big? I mean, I'm thinking about you know we did an interview last winter with with Carol Ann Sales from Boggy Creek Farm, uh, who's also there in Austin. Um, you know, and a lot of the folks that I talk to on the podcast and a lot of the energy in farming right now is around, 
you know, staying small and, you know, making, you know, figuring out how to make it go on, on an acre in a, you know, urban farming in town or, you know, but you really took that and kind of mm-hmm. blew all that up. I mean, you well, started with this tiny garden and, and away yeah, you I went. I don't think it was really a plan um, at all. It was just, you know, we, I think that I always, when I had the backyard garden, I think maybe it's just my nature, but I did the same thing with it. You know, it was, it was maximizing the potential of the space that I had. And then when I bought 20 acres after moving out of the backyard, I did the same thing with it. You know, it was, we ended up on 15 acres of vegetables, um, my first year growing in, uh, as a full-time job, I think that we grossed about $500,000. And then on the second year, we, we grossed a million dollars on the 15 acres. And so it was, uh, it was just taking what I had and looking at the markets that we had and trying to, uh, to do the best that we could, you know, be as productive as we could, but also, um, trying to uh trying to trying to meet the goals of having the best quality of vegetables that we could trying to meet the goals of trying to to take care of our our staff and our employees and just provide a really we were working to try to provide the best value and highest quality vegetables that we could to our to our customers did you find that doing it on a larger scale actually helped you to provide better quality? Well, I think that one of the things that probably helped us um, a lot as far as improving our quality was when we first started our relationship with Whole Foods. Because uh, once uh, we started selling to Whole Foods, I think it was in 2009, maybe, and uh, 2009 or, yeah, 2009 or 2010. I guess I was at that time when when we had to uh we started to sell tomatoes to whole foods. And that's a uh tomatoes are probably one of the harder vegetables to to sell wholesale because there's so many different their size, their shape, there's color. Um, you know, it's just a there's a lot of different qualities that you have to grade for. If you have a if you have a 30 by 50 foot backyard garden, it's really hard to meet the the quality standards um, because maybe well, you'd have very limited production and you've got a little, just a small amount to choose from. I do think that have, being at a larger scale allows us to have much better quality. And it's not just, you know, having, having more product, but as we, as I get more experience, um, it gets a lot easier too because we understand the time to plant. We understand the varieties that do best here. Uh, we understand if we see a deficiency or if we have an insect problem, how to deal with it. Uh, we understand proper watering techniques now. Uh, uh, so maybe a large part of the quality improvements is just having having more experience as well. Now, you mentioned that you've really relied on systems as an important part of developing your farm. That that's something that, that you've really emphasized. And I assume that, that a lot of those systems are designed so that other people can successfully interface with doing the work that has to be done on the farm. Because at 150 acres, you're certainly not, you're not out there hauling very often, at least. Yeah, you know, luckily with our cultivation systems that we have, um, the hoe isn't picked up too frequently on the farm anyway, so we're, we're fortunate for that, I guess. But my brother, is a um, he's a web developer, and uh, early on, when I first, you know, when we first started our CSA, we kept up with our CSA members on the spreadsheet, and when we, we quickly realized when it got, that that was a, that was going to be a difficult thing to do, because it was one thing to keep up with 25 CSA customers on the spreadsheet uh, when we were in the backyard garden. But then when we moved to the 20 acre farm and our CSA expanded to a hundred, um, it was really a chore to, to keep up with. So I asked my brother, I was like, Hey, is there any way that you would be able to help us with some kind of solution to this? And he, uh, he's been working alongside us, uh, since nearly the beginning of our farm and 
when it started as a business in 2008. And uh, he's developed a custom customer management system for us that from when we first started, we had uh, one box that was $25 and you could choose weekly or bi-weekly in four weeks or 10 weeks at a time. And now we have four different box sizes. Um, each box for, we have nearly 2,000 CSA members and each box is custom packed for our customers now. And it's all managed by this customer management system where uh, our members can go in and and actually choose uh, items that they want in their box or not want in their box. So each box is customized. And uh, wow. it's uh, we have stickers that we put on every box that shows the contents of it and as well as the customer's name, the pickup location, the time. And uh, we're delivering those Tuesday through Sunday uh, of every week, 52 weeks out of the year. A big part of, I mean, and you can imagine the complexity in harvesting for that because uh, if every box is custom packed, then we also have to have a system for managing the harvest. And I've got a great operations manager, uh, Krishna Raghavan, who him and his wife, um, over the weekend, over two or three weekends, they did a, some amazing custom programming using uh, Excel and a lot of visual basic and stuff and they uh they came up with a with a spreadsheet based system that allows us to uh manage our inventory and in all our coolers and uh it also plans the harvest for all the departments we have because we have to harvest for uh restaurant orders every day. We we deliver to over two hundred restaurants in Austin, uh San Antonio, Houston and Dallas. And uh, we have uh, have to manage the harvest for the restaurants, manage harvest for like larger grocers and co-ops like Wheatsville Co-op here in Austin, uh, Central Market, Whole Foods. And then we also have over 20 farmers markets that we attend every week. And uh, so it does get pretty, pretty complex. Yeah, that seems like that seems a little crazy. That's a, I mean, that's a lot of different ways to go about selling your produce. And I mean, mm-hmm. you're not talking about just selling to a few s- stores and restaurants. You said over 200 restaurants? Yes. Wow. So what we do every Monday is we send out a an availability report for um, – it, It's a we send out a, a newsletter to all of our restaurant uh, customers. And uh, the email that we send out to them shows us what we have fresh coming out of the ground that week. And uh, we we take orders on the, on a daily basis and harvest to order and deliver the next day. And you guys, of course, are managing your own deliveries. Mm-hmm. We have way too many trucks <laughs> <laughs> and uh, two two mechanics <laughs> to keep them okay. going. And how far when when you talk about Houston and Dallas and Austin, I don't and San Antonio, I don't know where all those things sit geographically yeah. in Texas. How, what kind of a radius are you guys delivering to? Well, we're right here in the middle um, in central Texas in, in Austin. And so San Antonio is 60 miles down the road. Uh, Houston is, uh, is, I think that's about two and a half or three hours away. Dallas is about three hours away. Waco is a, you know, an hour or so. Um, so we've got New Braunfels. It's, you know, not too far. That's a we have a farmers market at. So we're uh, we're our farm. It, it wasn't planned like this at all. But I just woke up and somehow the the backyard garden got started in the middle of 17 million people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I guess if you were going to pick a place to to have a farm, having a really strong home base and then three more urban areas around you is not a bad way to go. Yeah, and and to top it off, to have a year-round growing climate, you know? So you guys are actually producing then 12 months of the year? Yes. Now, of course, your crop mix is changing because you guys do have something that resembles winter down there in Texas, don't you? Yeah, we. I, I think one of the things that when you, like for myself, like I'm still trying to adjust to feeling like I'm a farmer now. I still kind of, it hasn't been 
I haven't been farming that long, so it's still it's still a lot of learning for me and and a lot of new things. But since I didn't grow up farming, there wasn't like a a path for me to follow. I just tried to go and look all over the country at people that were successful and tried to figure out what I wanted, who I wanted to aspire to. And, you know, I had a lot of good influences like um, John Paul Cortens at Roxbury Farm and not far from you, uh, Richard DeWild at Harmony, Harmony Valley. And I was really uh, inspired by Full Circle Farm and some of the farms in California, like uh, Eat Well and Full Belly and Be Wise Ranch. I mean, there's a lot of really neat, great farmers around the country, but I would call these guys up and just want to be their best friends. And <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I learned a lot. But what one thing that, I, that just made sense to me was the first year uh, when I was farming at my larger farm, uh, the tw- or the 20 acre farm, uh, and just starting out our CSA and kind of uh, one of the difficulties that I found was that when we took off two weeks in the middle of the summer, it was really hard to get the momentum back and and the, we lost some customers and I was like, well, why, why stop? You know, because it's, it's hard to start the farm back up. It's much easier just to keep it going and uh, maintain the staff, uh, maintain the rhythm and uh, the customers are, appreciated it that we're at the farmer's market every week and that they can have a CSA share every week, that it's just not a seasonal thing that they can eat local. And uh, the difficulty that I was looking at was how could we have something besides okra and eggplant and hot peppers in the middle of the summer? And what I really started to look at was um, an explorer with my brother using computers and kind of, uh, modeling things was uh, how could we use some storage facilities to help us have more variety um, for our storage crops. And from the very beginning of when I first started, uh, we bought a cooler. It was an old milk truck, and I put a two-horsepower refrigeration unit on it. And uh, we started storing, you know, storage crops like onions and carrots and cabbage and potatoes and things like that and it just really helped us out a lot because when we would go to the farmer's market we'd have a a huge variety we might have 40 different crops or you know 40 plus crops at the farmer's market and some other vendors you know might just have like two or three and it it really put us at a at a big advantage and then also with our CSA customers, they were really happy because they had a a lot more variety than what they would have if we wouldn't have had the storage facilities. I think all along we've just been uh, we we expanded those milk trucks to fourteen different milk trucks, and then we finally realized that carrying boxes in and out of these milk trucks is <laughs> is really not easy. And we transitioned into building coolers and we bought a forklift on Craigslist, you know, like $2,000 or something. And we, we built our coolers where we could drop the forklifts in and out of the coolers. And that made, that was a tremendous improvement. Yeah. That materials handling piece to doing storage crops is huge. And I think those, I think storage crops are something that, I mean, there's been people doing these for a long time, but it's a, it's a really important way of doing season extension that I think it's not nearly as sexy as doing high tunnels. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but man, does it work, you know? And I, and I think with, with a lot, uh, a lot less complication than what you sometimes run into with high tunnels. Mm -hmm. Well, it wouldn't be possible for us to have carrots in the summertime here, you know, in the middle of the summer, but we we're growing a spring carrot crop right now and we're, we'll pull them out of the ground whenever it just starts to get, it won't be much longer before we pull them out of the ground and it'll, when it starts to get warm. And uh, we'll have carrots through, you know, through the, hopefully we'll have them th- throughout the year. You know, I think that last year when we were just exhausting our our spring carrot supply, then our fall carrots came on, you know. And uh, we're, we're well known in Austin for really, really s- super sweet carrots. We, 
we actually um a project that we've been working on for for some time and I'm kind of proud of that happened this year was we distributed carrots to all 130 schools in Austin uh, this year. And um, also our beets were on the salad bars that they have in selected schools in Austin. So that was, that was nice. That's really cool. What a, what a great way to really reach out into the community. So just to, to kind of, to loop back to these, to this idea of, of systems and things that you're, that you're looking for when you're developing systems, how do you, how do you identify where you need to, to get a new system in place so that you can have something that runs itself rather than having you have to make everything happen? Well, I think as far as, uh, you know, one of the things that I do on the farm is I just really try to keep an open mind and kind of look and see where the fires are and where, where there's, where we have some problems and where we can make some improvements. And so it's it's never predictable on where we're we're going to work next, but it's like, I can just give you a rundown of a few of the things that we've done that have really been helpful, you know, that uh, might might inspire some other people. Since we do so many farmers markets every week, um, you know, one of the big things for a, a farm that I think can help it out tremendously is having a loading dock. And so we, we have a loading dock that handles 10 trucks at a time. But if you just have a loading dock that can handle one truck, it's, it's amazing. And uh, we, uh, we moved to focusing on the materials handling is really important. And uh, so pallets, we, we, we moved to a, utilizing pallets, um, forklifts, uh, and one way that we really helped us with our farmer's markets is that we came up with this idea to create a wonder pallet. And so the wonder pallet is like a heavy duty pallet that you can't tear up. We built, we had a, we built them out of steel and tried to make them as lightweight as we could, but not where they wouldn't get torn up like some of our other wooden pallets. And what well, the wonder pallet contains is everything for that farmer's market. So if we have a, uh, a two tent booth, it might hold all the tables that we need. It holds the tents. It holds the scales, uh, the shopping baskets, all the price signs, everything on this pallet. And so when it comes time to load the truck for the farmer's market, all we have to do is grab the pallet, put it on the truck, and uh, the vegetables for that farmer's market are done in a similar way. We have a um, we have a farmer's market manager and our farmer's market staff at each of the booths uh, each week fill out a report that tells if we had too much of an item, too little, any quality issues. So each week we're, we're dialing in exactly what we need to carry to each farmer's market. And so come the weekend, the farmer's market manager has a report of what he needs to build on the pallet for the farmer's market for each one of the 20 ones that we attend. And uh, so those, those, pallets are packed uh, the day before the market and in the morning of the market all we have to do is grab the pallet and put it on the truck and put the wonder pallet on and then go to the market it's it's a lot easier than how we used to do it (laughs) i used to uh get up at about four o'clock in the morning and pull everything out of the cooler that we had and i just tried to, to guess on the best allocation and uh so it really wasn't we weren't we were harvesting what was ready in the field and then trying to sell it. And now we're harvesting what we predict that we can, we can sell and trying to match our production to meet that. It's a, it's a big change. So almost in, in that sense, treating the farmer's market like a separate customer that's place, essentially placing an order and saying, we need this many bunches of carrots to come to farmer's mm-hmm. market this week, just like somebody might at say Whole Foods or at a restaurant. Uh-huh. And, that, and it, it it works amazing for us um, to do it this way, and and having feedback every week, um, really really happy with the with the way that we do it now. It's not 
it's not stressful at all. I really like the fact that you have space in, in your record keeping system to have the farmer's market staff know whether you needed to bring more or less of different items rather than just recording how much was sold. I've always thought this was an important piece of information that's oftentimes missing from farmer's market sheets when I, when I work with other farms is you know, what time did you sell out? You know, it's not just mm-hmm. how much did you sell, but what time did you sell out? So you can try to try to figure out, you know, what, I mean, if you, if you brought 20 bunches of carrots and you sold out at eight o'clock in the morning, market goes till noon, there's lots of room to bring a lot more carrots. You know, yeah. if you sold those 20 bunches of carrots at 1159 markets over at noon, you probably don't need to bring more carrots next week. Mm-hmm. You know? So I think I think that kind of information and feedback flow is so important to loop that back in. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a big help for us. Um, I you know I think with my with my brother, you know, first starting helping us develop our crop, we call it our crop production model. We developed a, a model that shows when every crop is planted into the ground, and then it shows when the expected harvest date is. Shows us all of our inputs. Um, I got. I first got the idea from Brookside Farm, I think, on the East Coast. They had a computer spreadsheet that they would let you download for, or they send it to you for twenty five dollars, and then we just took that and and built on it. And um, it's been an amazing tool for us to. Uh, we have um, on our farm. We have about sixty um, blocks of fifty beds each, and um, every block has a has a number and every bed is is numbered like 20 and ha- we have uh, tw- like 25 beds to the north of the riser 25 beds to the south of the riser and we have blocks uh a through e and i go one through 13 and so it having a having to design like that makes it real easy to um know you know plan our rotations and plan our crops um communicate on the farm um and when we're when we're doing our crop planning you know it it really gets complicated in the greenhouse you know we have uh we have five greenhouses on our farm and then we have another twelve thousand square feet of shade uh house and uh it's a big job to to make sure that the transplants are ready at the right time. Uh, since we're we're certified organic, uh, there's not a source around us since we're not an agricultural area to buy certified organic transplants. So we have to we have to produce our own. And so that was a whole nother uh when I was in the backyard I had a ten by ten greenhouse that I built with uh one inch PVC pipes. And that worked well. And now we have you know now we have the five greenhouses and that's what's necessary to have enough space to grow everything. And just to germinate our our crops uh, in January, like our tomatoes and peppers and eggplant, we had to put a, a hot water heating system in the floor of one of our uh, 30 by 100 foot greenhouses. And we did a radiant, uh, con- radiant heated concrete floor. And uh, wow. it works at it. I made up the design myself, and so I was kind of nervous if it was going to work or not. But and it was probably about four or five thousand dollars in equipment and everything, and I was really, <laughs> I was really scared that it wasn't going to work. But it, uh, we have a temperature probe that we can put in the soil of our transplants, and we can set our thermostat to the temperature that we'd like it, and it just dials it in just, just perfectly to to germinate the transplants. Just to give us an idea, how many tomato transplants are we talking about? Um, let's see. This year, I think that we have, uh, I think that we have about a hundred thousand plants. So, Brenton, with that, we're going to take a break here, get a word from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back with more from uh, Brenton Johnson of Johnson's Backyard Garden. Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, helping plants make sugar from sunshine since 1992. Through 23 years of producing the best potting soils you can buy, Vermont Compost Company founder and owner Carl Hammer has stayed intimately involved in the company, working with a small staff of committed individuals to provide compost-based potting soils chock full of microbial partners and humus-bound nutrients. The people at Vermont Compost Company have a practical understanding of the challenges organic growers face, and they combine that with the comprehensive 
comprehensive understanding of soil and plant science, and an intuitive comprehension that often has Carl and his crew sticking their noses into a handful of compost and inhaling deeply as though they were sampling a fine brandy. Vermont compost is the real thing, built on consistency instead of glitz. Like the donkey on their logo, Vermont compost potting soils aren't glitzy or glamorous. They're steadfast and consistent, stubbornly making certain that your transplants can get everything they need from a few cubic centimeters of soil. Oh, by the way, the donkeys are the real thing, and you get a little bit of donkey manure in every batch of Vermont compost potting soil. Feed your plants the best. VermontCompost.com This episode of the Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by Growing for Market magazine. I first ran into Growing for Market in 1993 while working at Wisconsin's Harmony Valley Farm, and I've been a subscriber ever since. At Harmony Valley Farm, I learned that information is the number one coin of our realm, and it provides an almost infinite return on investment. Then, as now, there were a lot of farming magazines out there. There were also a lot of gardening magazines, but other than Growing for Market, there were no other market farming magazines available. And I have to say, I've learned something from every issue over the past 23 years. Growing for Market was founded by a farmer with the idea of fostering the exchange of news and ideas about market farming among market farmers themselves. In fact, Growing for Market was one of the inspirations for the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Available by mail or online, Growing for Market also offers options to access the archive of everything published from 2001 to the present, an invaluable, searchable record reference. Subscribe today at growingformarket.com. All right. And we're back with Brenton Johnson from Johnson's Backyard Garden. Brenton, you're farming down in Austin, Texas. I'm imagining that the, your irrigation needs are pretty different there than they are here in, in uh, southern Wisconsin. Uh, I, I think the plant water requirement is probably the, pretty close to the same, but I think that the difference is that maybe you guys uh, have a shorter growing season, so your need for water is a little less, and I think that uh, you probably get a lot more rain than we do. Yeah. So, I mean, how much rain do you guys get in Austin? I mean, you mentioned you guys had some bad floods last fall, but do you get regular rainfall throughout the year? Really, the the weather in Austin is extremely bearable. Um, since I've been farming, we've had we've had periods where we've had nearly a year and not had any rain, and then we've had 15 inches of rain in one day. Uh, so it's uh it's not a it's not a very steady climate here at all. Um, so on average, in Austin, I think the rainfall is 30 to 33 inches a year. But it's uh, it's never average here. And you said you've got six wells for irrigation on your farm. It's uh, I think the biggest thing for you know for having a vegetable farm is water is an absolute necessity in order to to be able to produce a uh, a dependable crop. And ever since I started, um, I think you know probably because I have I worked in water resources for ten years. Um, and worked with farms and irrigation districts when I was working with the government is I realized the importance of water and um, I knew how to, to calculate what what our needs were. And I realized that if I was going to be able to sleep at night and, and uh, you know, I needed to have, have an adequate water supply. So when we were looking for land, that was one of the things that we were we're definitely paying attention to uh, where we're located. We're, we only have to dig down about 40 to 50 feet because we're in an alluvial aquifer. We're right next to uh, a major river in Texas and uh, we have a really good water supply, but putting in our irrigation system on our farm was a definite undertaking. And uh, you know, everything from figuring out how can we pay for it because uh, when you're putting in five miles of irrigation pipe and six wells and bringing electricity to a farm and three phase power. And it's a, it's a very big expense, but I ended up uh, when I first bought the 40 acres of 200, one of my CSA customers um, through a, a slow money loan, he, uh, he helped us roll the financing of, of our first two irrigation wells and, and pipeline into the purchase cost of the farm. And then uh, when we moved in a year later in 2011, um, 
we purchased 150 more acres and uh, we ended up having to be creative there as well. And we got some assistance to the Natural Resources Conservation Service to uh, to help with our pipeline and uh, convert our, our farm to uh, drip irrigation. So is everything on your farm done through drip irrigation or are you also using some overhead? We have um, sprinkler pipe and we have a, a hose reel. Um, we used to use the hose reel uh, when we were uh, previously, but we 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 don't typically uh, utilize it at all. And we utilize the sprinkler pipe a lot uh, less frequently now. It's just about um, if we have a real quick crop, you know, where it doesn't um, make sense to uh, put your tape down. We just because it's going to be there for such a short time. We might use sprinkler pipe, but most most of all of our farm is on drip now. And is that is that drip under black plastic, or are you laying that on top of the soil, or how are you managing that? We we do it both ways. Actually, um, last year I made a a choice, uh, or October before last, I made a choice to eliminate all the black plastic on our farm, and with the major flooding that we had in the spring and the fall. Um, it ended up that without having a mulch cover over our crops, that a lot of our fertility got washed away. And also with all the rain, we uh, it was a hard first year to to make such a drastic change in our operations. That are is a big learning curve to go from growing tomatoes on plastic versus not. And our, some of our squashes, um, you know, we didn't have the same yields that we had had before, and our peppers didn't turn out like they had previously and so reluctantly this year i ended up um, making a change back to using uh plastic for some of our summer crops uh but now that they're growing it's just uh it's it's kind of bittersweet for me i really don't don't want to use plastic on the farm because there's not a good recycling option uh for us here in central texas yet and i hate to throw it away but uh, it also comes down to being able to balance the business, you know, as far as the the finance part. Um, and so we're on every crop that we can grow without plastic. We we do it that way, and as long as we get satisfactory yields, and we can figure it out. And some crops we're experimenting, so we'll grow some on plastic and some not on trying to uh, to figure out how you know if it's necessary or not. Right. And if you're, if you're doing the drip irrigation, then on the bare soil, if you're just laying that tape on top of the soil, have you figured out a, a good way to manage that? So what we do is we have a, um, we shank it in. With okay. A, with a tool from, uh, there's a company in California called Andros Engineering that makes a shank. And then we have a, a homemade bed sh- press pan that goes uh, behind the shanks to smooth the, the bed out on top. Okay. A- after the the drip tape is shanked in an inch or two below the soil. Right. And then how do you manage cultivation around that if you've actually got that tape buried and make sure you're not hitting it? Mm-hmm. So I would I would encourage, um, you know, maybe your listeners to, to check out one of my inspirations. Like for when I first got started farming, He's got some really good resources on his website, but uh, Roxbury Farm, um, they farm about 40 to 50 acres, I think, for their CSA, about a 1,200-member CSA, serving uh, New York. They're in the Hudson Valley, and they serve uh, New York City. Right. And uh, basically what I did was when I first started was I I started to look at his crop production guides and harvest manuals. And I think I read them probably 100 or 200 times. Every time I would read them, I'd learn more and more. And I, I kind of, in, I could see how the system that he had developed for his farm worked together. And I, when I first uh, moved out of the backyard garden, you know, and I was starting to farm on 20 acres, I realized I couldn't do things, anything like that I'd done before, you know where everything was done by hand. And then, you know, when you go to 15 acres, it, it's not, it's a little bit harder to do it the same way. And 
I um, I ended up making a a big investment in equipment, and um, we we it's not there's no easy cheap way to do it. I think to start out because um, it takes when you're moving from a hand system to a mechanized system. Uh, there's a lot of different pieces of equipment that all have to work together in tandem, and so I was. I was lucky enough that um, my father worked for the Farm Service Agency, and that's an, a government agency that loans money to beginning farmers. I didn't really think too much of it when I was growing up. My dad, you know, he he was a lender for the government to give money to farmers. And when I moved out of the backyard and I found this 20 acres to east of downtown, like a light flashed on in my head, and I said, "Call my dad up," and I was like, "Dad." Is there any way that I could qualify for a, a government loan to help me buy this farm and, and some equipment? And uh, it was funny because I had to end up doing um, amended tax returns for when I was in the backyard garden, and I had to bring out the uh, the loan officer from the Farm Service Agency. I filled out all the paperwork, and I'd been in government for 10 years, so I was used to jumping through the hoops, but she came up to the uh, – she came – she had to do a farm inspection, and uh, she was like, we're in downtown Austin. <laughs> and uh, I showed her my <laughs> – she'd seen all my sales and everything, but she's like, this isn't what I was expecting. She's like, if my district director could see this. <laughs> and uh, so I showed her the front yard, and I showed her the backyard, and uh, she just – I don't think that they thought there was any way that it was going to work, but I was so persistent. And I was asking my dad, how could I make it work? And he's like, yeah, I don't think, I don't see how they could turn you down. <laughs> and uh, so it turned out that I did, I was uh, successful in getting a loan for uh, for purchasing uh, the 20 acres. And uh, also got another loan for $100,000 to buy equipment. And based on using that Roxbury's uh, system, I bought a lot of the same equipment that he had, you know, his land and transplanters, a Mater Mac vacuum seeder, uh, set my tires on 72 inches centers um, for six foot beds. And then we just developed a, a cultivation system that worked with that. Um, we were using a five row basket weeder and uh, cultivation knives. And um, we ended up purchasing some used uh, high crop tractors with. 48 inch or 45 inch rubber that the tires are real narrow. They're, they're vegetable motor tractors. And, um, we didn't know how to drive the tractors. We didn't know how to do anything. And we just had to, had to figure it out. And, uh, luckily, you know, we, we, we were able to figure it out <laughs> and it's, uh, we kind of slowly added our, our, our staff members, you know, a little bit at a time. And, we all basically just kind of learned how to farm together, you know. When you say you added your added your staff members a little at a time and and learned to farm together, do you have pretty good staff retention on your farm? Well, I still have the the first employee that was in the backyard garden. Uh, Matt Pelkey is our our CSA manager. All the people that that started, um, all the managers, you know, or the people that started in two thousand nine. One is our harvest manager. One right now is our head grower. The other one is in charge of our cultivation. Uh, so we we have a lot of turnover in some positions, and then but the key the key management positions we uh, we just have all the pretty much all the original people. I would imagine that in your previous life you didn't. I mean, as a as a water resource manager, it's not like you're you would have been working with large crews of people and, and having folks in management positions working under you. How did you, how have you had to learn how to work with, with people in those positions and, and well, what have you not, learned in that process? Yeah, it's, I can tell you, it's definitely not easy. And I think probably, uh, I can't take credit <laughs> for, uh, for being the easiest to work with because I, I'm, I'm a, go, go, go all the time and full of energy and wanting to, to get things done. But 
luckily I've been able to find find uh, people that complement the skills that I have. And one of the things that I was really fortunate to have was to bring on a an operations manager that is just amazing with people and uh, has his master's in finance and ran a $10 million company before he came to work with us. And uh, he, in combination with me and and, and him uh, running the company, we've just we've made a made a really good team. And he he handles a lot of the, uh, the operations and the the logistics and the personnel and and the finance. And I focus on like my background is a is a planner and uh, coming up with the new ideas all the time and. He's uh he's pulling the the reins back and trying to trying to keep it in check, I guess. When you say pulling pulling the reins back, trying to keep your growth in check, trying to keep trying you from to, adding more acres, or well, we're 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 always doing new things. It's new, you know. Like a we we just put in last year, we uh, we put in over five hundred uh, grapes. So we started a, a vineyard, and um, they're they're red table grapes. Uh, we built a, uh, a 12,000 foot shade structure the past, uh, three or four past three weeks, we built two, um, vegetable harvest trailers. And so there are these big 30 foot wings that are held up by a cable system that we, we custom built in our shop to make it where our, our harvesters don't have to lift boxes anymore. And so where we can make things more efficient in our harvest in the field for like squash right. and cucumbers and things like that. Uh, right. So, so basically I'm always pushing to do new things and spend money and <laughs> like build a, <laughs> build a packing shed. And he's like, Whoa there, buddy. <laughs> Hold back. So I think it's great to have somebody on the farm like that. Yeah. It's my nature to be a, to put the pedal to the metal and go, go, go. And that's what makes it fun though always do something new uh, i think if i was you know just growing spinach here i'd shoot myself or something you know because it first of all i'd be too scared that something's going to go wrong and i've got all my eggs in one basket and then it'd just be too boring and so we're always trying to figure out new things that we could do to keep it exciting that's still in line with our mission um one of the things that we're doing now is we're starting to grow a lot of fruit trees and we're starting to to do it to have the uh, nursery sales and so in addition to selling vegetables, we also sell transplants and we sell fruit trees, grapes. We're learning grafting. Um, we grow figs, persimmons, pears, pomegranates, loquats. Um, so that's a new that was a new thing for us this past year that we're we're just uh, we're it's a new uh, avenue for us, I guess. Now, you guys don't have any livestock on the farm, do you? Our first year, we had three cows, and we sold um, halves of beef. But the uh, the cows uh, ran away midsummer, and I think I vowed after that to never have livestock again. Because <laughs> I like it, but the vegetables, they don't run away, you know. That is um, a nice thing about plants. <laughs> we're lucky to partner with uh, a couple really nice farms around here that have uh, – uh, there's an organic grain mill here in Austin, Coyote Creek Farm, and they produce some amazing eggs. And then we also partner with another uh, farm, Ringer Family Farm here in Austin, that that raised some some wonderful eggs as well. That they've been our supplier since we since we stopped producing them in the backyard garden. We didn't continue um, after that. And those are products that you're selling alongside of the CSA shares. Yeah, it's a it's an add-on. Um, we've got a few. We offer a few add-ons to our CSA, like coffee or citrus from an, another organic farm that we partner with in the Lower Rio Grande Valley, and and eggs. We've got a few a few add-ons like that that we offer. One of the things that I was interested that you commented earlier was about the support that you got from the CSA last year when you were having problems with the weather. And it's interesting to me because the way you described your CSA working coming in these four-week four or 10-week uh, subscription options, uh, 
it doesn't it's it's not the it's not what I think of as being a traditional model of a CSA of people buying in and supporting a farm for a full extended period of time. It's it's kind of a short term subscription. Mm -hmm. well, um, one yeah, could you just talk about that, yeah, that a little bit? Yeah, one of the things that I think that we have tried to do is uh, we try to listen to our customers, and part of the feedback that we got was a lot of our customers are on a on a we might have students or just people that are um, not able to afford to purchase six months or a year at a time for a vegetable subscription. And so what we tried to do is make it where it's affordable for people of all, you know, income levels. If you can't afford to have a CSA box, we have an opportunity where people can come out here and volunteer on our farm five days out of the week. And, uh, we get a lot of help from our volunteers uh, that way. But the problem that we were having is that just people, not everyone can afford to pay for a CSA subscription up front. And that's when we decided to uh, let people have the opportunity to pay a month at a time or every two months at a time. So we offer a, a lot of different options for our customers. Uh, we do have the option for customers to pay six months or a year at a time and um, receive a uh, just like the traditional CSA model that you know you're describing, you're, you're more familiar with. But yeah, in addition, in addition to offering annual subscriptions, we offer uh, we offer shorter term as well. And so when we so when we had such a bad uh, since we, since when we had the losses this year, um, we were we reached out to our CSA community and we we explained to them the difficulties that we were having, and we asked people to join for six months or a year if they could, and we got a really good response to that, and uh, it was real helpful. Has that has that created cash flow problems for you then uh, further down the line? No, I think, you know, uh, what we have always done is try to, uh, instead of standing on one on one leg, we stand on, you know, about five legs with having outlets for wholesale and for farmers markets and CSA and, you know, the different, the various outlets that we sell to. And so it, uh, it, ha it hasn't, um, with, by having those, all the different outlets, it's, uh, it ha you know, that it hasn't been a problem. Great. And and about those different outlets, one of the things uh, that has come up about you guys is that, that you're quite the marketer, apparently. Now, I mean, I don't know. I haven't been to your farmer's market. But, um, I mean, you guys, Johnson's Backyard Gardens even has its own font that I that I read about. <laughs> so, um, can you talk to us a little bit about, about not, yeah. just, not just the, the, the markets that you go to, but do you have a marketing philosophy? Is there something that ties together all of your, all of your marketing efforts? Well, luckily, uh, the person that helped us most with our graphic designer, uh, you know, I met when I was, when I was in the backyard garden and, uh, he was, uh, he's a, he had a really well-paying job for, a you know, a, an important, you know, firm here in Austin, but he just kind of got tired with his work and he's like, I, I just want to work for people that, that I enjoy working with. And so he started doing work for bands and some, you know, different companies. And we ended up uh, meeting and uh, his name is Ryan Rhodes. He has a company in Austin called uh, Land. And he, um, he just did an amazing job kind of creating some, some really cool branding for us and me and him work real closely together um, and just crafting the, I guess the image that we feel is appropriate for the farm. You know, we hand painted all of our trucks and uh, that everyone in town, uh, one of the things that's real popular, I think, is you see a lot of our, our trucker hats around town. And luckily we kind of got picked up by uh, some one of our musicians here, uh, Shaky Graves, is a is a local musician, but he's he's kind of uh, popular around the U.S. and he 
he throws out our hats at his concerts and uh you know <laughs> <laughs> we uh yeah it's uh it's surprising but you know we we have um we we did end up um creating a mock up of our farmers market boots early on in the uh in our pecan orchard here at the farm and what we tried to do was we wanted to come up with a with a way you know to make our boots really attractive and make the vegetables look their best and so i guess we did put a we put some effort into uh kind of standardizing our our brand and how we do things at markets and it makes us it, it helps a lot you know we're recognizable and people know who we are and they 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 come they come back to see us you know every week and, and support us at, at the market you know and i would think that with with all of the different outlets that you're going to that having that sort of tied together branding must really make a difference. You know, somebody sees your stuff at Whole Foods, hopefully they're, they recognize you and have the, you know, have the ability to get in t- touch with you about a CSA share if they want more of what they got. Yeah, it definitely helps. And I think for me, it just kind of came, uh, it was not something I really thought about too much, but it was just like, an, I knew that it was something that was important that we needed to do. Um, if you go to a farmer's market and you just see someone with vegetables there and they don't have a sign up and they don't have a tablecloth and their vegetables are just sitting on the table and then they're like wondering, like, how come it's not working out too well, you know, with the sales here? Um, I think if you can have, you know, there's a lot of things that that we kind of keep in mind, you know, when we're trying to make an attractive retail display. And I always just keep my eyes open for new ideas for any kind of business. You know, if I go into a grocery store or any kind of retail place and I just try to look at, man, what is, what are they doing good here that is working, you know? And I try to stand back from the booth and look at it and just pretend like I'm a customer and like, oh, well, that doesn't have a price sign on it. I'm not going to buy that because I don't know how much it is, you know, or we we try to be creative. Like we, um, we hired a volunteer to hand paint watercolor price signs for all our vegetables. And then they, we got inspired by Trader Joe's here in Austin. I was I was in Trader Joe's and I was looking at their price signs on their store, and they had all these neat tidbits and they were done up real well. And I took pictures of them and uh, I must have thought I was crazy walking around the store taking pictures. But I came back into the office the next day and I was like, "Hey, can we get someone to do this?" And it turns out we had a volunteer that was an artist and she made, you know, some really neat price signs for us and with lots of uh, interesting bits of information and real colorful. And, uh, we use those at all of our farmer's markets now. It's, it's always funny to go and, and take ideas from corporate America about marketing. But I think one of the reasons they do what they do is that it works. Yeah. You know, and, and certainly that idea of creating that unique, that unique look and those things that, that give information and draw people in, regardless of what, what venue you're in, that's important to do. Well. I, I, uh, we, we got the inspiration there, but we kind of just t- take our, you know, we'll take our own take on it. And, uh, it's, uh, we're, I guess the, the way that we're trying, that we try to operate is that we're just, it's continuous improvement. And one thing that some people say, you know, is that, Brent, you're not afraid to change, you know, if it's not working, you know, you're going to change. A lot of times, if you have something invested in something, then you just sort of try to want to make it work. But we don't, we don't operate that way. If it's not working, we're going to start over and try to fix it the right way. I really like that. With that, Brenton, let's let's turn to our lightning round and ask you a, a couple of pointed questions here. What's your favorite tool on the farm? Uh, you know, it's tough to have a favorite. Uh, one of one of the things that uh, People have said, you know, what's the difference between backyard gardening and running an organic farm? And uh, I always tell people that when I was in the backyard garden, that versus how I'm doing things now, that everything is totally different. I, it's not even. <laughs> it's, there's very few similarities. Uh, you know, in the backyard garden, it was non-mechanized and. Uh, I think what I like about farm 
the scale that we're at now is that even though it is a more complex system, all of our tools and equipment, um, you know, they're integrated together to achieve a desired product. And uh, if I had to pick my favorite tool, I'd say it'd be our two new harvest trailers, you know, that we just uh, custom welded and they're going to help us harv like harvest five or seven beds at a time. And our, our crew won't have to, you know, lift the boxes by, uh, by hand anymore. Uh, a close second would be our bean harvester though, because if we, uh, we, almost everything we, we, we harvest on our farm is done by hand, but I, we only have um, a crew of about, uh, right now we have 18 harvesters and there's no way that we could have enough green beans. We could take enough green beans for all of our CSA customers and farmers markets and restaurants uh, by hand with all the other different vegetable crops that are growing. And so that, the bean harvester makes, helps us uh, be able to grow green beans and have them for all of our customers and still, um, not have to uh, hire a small army to take them. Yeah, those bean harvesters when you're when you're operating at scale can make a huge difference. Do you do you harvest those and then are they going across a shaker table for some additional sorting after that? Yeah, I was I, I bought a used uh, bean harvester and shaker table um, uh, a few years ago, and uh, that's that's what we use. All right, it's still it's still a lot of work. <laughs> Yeah, but it's but at least it's not at least it's not bet over double out in the field picking beans. Yeah. You know? that, when we when we first start the season, that's how we do it. But then when we get into the, the main crop, we use the harvester. Okay. And I mean, something we didn't really talk about a lot, Brenton, was was kind of quality of life and and you know how you actually manage your time. So I'm curious, what was the last purely recreational activity that you did? Uh, you know, last summer I went out to, uh, I was always a deadhead in college and I, um, I had a 1966 Volkswagen bus that I bought for $50 and we built from scratch and traveled all over the United States for a hundred, I think probably 120, 130 Grateful Dead shows. So last summer, uh, when the Grateful Dead got together, um, again, I ended up uh, buying an old Volkswagen bus, uh, 1970 camper on Craigslist. And I drove it out to, uh, Santa Clara and just outside of, uh, San Francisco for, I took a two week road trip and that was, it was awesome. I love that. That's great. And, um, other than the harvest trailers, what are you going to be doing differently on the farm this year? Well, we're we're building our packing shed right now, and so I'm really excited about that. Um, we're building these giant coolers that are 22 feet tall for holding um, some of our root crops and uh, and onion crops. So we've got two coolers we're building this year, um, and uh, we'll store carrots and beets and onions, and uh, so that's a that's a new project that we're they were working on it uh, as we speak. That's going to be a lot of fun. You said two different coolers. So you've got, you have one cooler for your root crops and then one cooler like for the, for the onions and garlic, right? Well, we have, um, I, I think all the different coolers that we have, the temperature zones are like seven different temperature zones because we'll have a 33 degree wet, 33 degree dry, 55 degree, 45 degree. We have an egg cooler. We have a seed a seed storage cooler. So um, it's uh, this is just the first phase in a, in building. Right now, our farms are located ten miles apart, and we have our our current coolers and our packing shed is on our twenty acre farm, and all of our production is on our two hundred acre farm. And so every day, we're having to bring two or three trucks to our packing shed and uh, then we that's where our vegetables are distributed from is from our um, from our 20 acre farm closer to town but we're in the process of centralizing all of our 
facilities onto our bigger 200-acre farm. But it's just a uh, it's a really big and expensive project, and we're just having to do a phased approach as we can afford it. And finally, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Uh, I think what I would say was that, you know, taking a farm or building a farm, it doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. You know, we, I think for us, we grew really, really fast and, um, but still it's been almost, uh, from 2005, you know, to now it's been 10 years. Um, I think what I would tell someone is that there's a, there's an important balance that you have to maintain between work and family life. And um, that's something really important to keep in mind. Um, the importance of, of both as you're, as you're starting to farm and, and continuing to farm. And I think waiting for those systems to, to kick in and, and, you know, it's, I think it's really easy to, have your eye on the prize and be like, okay, if I can just get, you know, if we can just get this one more thing done, then everything's going to work smoothly. And I think, you know, some of it's knowing that there's always going to be work to do, Mm -hmm. you know? One thing I can say is, uh, I feel like, uh, this year things are really clicking and the farm is just humming along better than I ever could have hoped it would. You know, we have, we have an amazing group here of about a hundred employees and it just feels like a big family. You know, everyone uh, is working together and we've, over time we've developed our organizational structure and our systems and our, and our communication is something that we work on all the time uh, continuously to just try and improve it more and more. And um, I'm really looking forward to an awesome an awesome year uh, in 2016. Brenton, thank you so much for making time to be on the podcast today. No problem. It was a lot of fun. And uh, just before I go, I wanted to mention one thing. Uh, when we first started out, we were all based with uh, interns and, and volunteers, and that's kind of how we got started. And then I realized that it was a little bit difficult to mix uh, business and farming. And about uh, three years ago, um, myself, along with some other people in Austin, we founded a nonprofit uh, organization called FarmShare Austin, and they have a six-month training program where they uh, invite students from all over the country to come and uh, and learn organic farming and uh, live on the farm. And I just uh, wanted to encourage people to uh, to check out Farm Share Austin if they get a chance. It's uh, that's great. It's a ten acre farm that's located adjacent to ours, and they have a great uh, program for aspiring organic farmers. Great. And I just googled that, and if you just Google Farm Share Austin, it's going to show right up. And I'm also going to include a link for that in the show notes. So. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Great. Thanks again, Brenton. Okay. We'll see you, Chris. All right, so wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 62 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast, and then you can find the notes for the show at farmertofarmerpodcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Johnson. If you enjoy the podcast, I'll bet you'd enjoy my email newsletter, The Flying Rutabaga. You can check that out at farmertofarmerpodcast.com or purplepitchfork.com. Also, if you enjoy the show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review or talk to us in the show notes, or tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. Your reviews and referrals make a huge difference in our ability to reach out to a growing circle of listeners. One more thing, I appreciate so much all of the guest suggestions that I received through the suggestions form on the farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Please let me know who you would like to hear from, and I'll do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there, and keep the tractor running.